Hi everyone, I'm Danny, and I'm here to share my three tips on what I think it means to host equitable and engaging spaces online. I'm a large-bodied cisgendered woman with short reddish brown hair. I'm currently wearing oversized square teal glasses, multiple earrings in both ears, a black button-down shirt, and a dark green sweater cardigan. And right now I'm standing in my office in London, Ontario, Canada, uh, with a very messy bookcase behind me. So uh, creating equitable and engaging spaces for me uh, means ensuring that you create an environment that works for everyone. And this means don't make assumptions about participants' background, knowledge, or needs. Equitable facilitation starts with equitable access. And this includes access to information, access to knowledge, and access to the ability to participate. In my sessions, I try to describe key visuals so that any information contained in them is available to everyone in the session. I also try to explain terms or concepts that I use, especially acronyms, so that people understand what I'm talking about. I no longer assume that any terms are common knowledge, though once in a while I still catch myself using academic or buzzwords without a clear explanation uh, and then try to correct. In some sessions, I do find it helpful to start with a survey or poll asking folks what they already know um, or where they want to begin. And if I have any interactive activities planned, I always try to orientate uh, participants to the tools and technologies that I want them to use. Even if they are, in my own experience, commonly used tools, there's always a good possibility that they're new for someone in the room. I try to create a safe way for participants to let me know if their needs aren't being met, but I think it's really important to frame this as a conversation about access needs rather than a required accommodations. Everyone has access needs and not every environment meets everyone's access needs, no matter how much work you do in advance to try and make your online environments more accessible. So I invite feedback on how I can do better to make the online environment more inclusive. My second tip is related but distinct, uh, and it's that I try to not force a certain type of participation in how I design sessions. I recognize that there are many different types of engagement and that all types of engagement hold equal value. So it's important to create opportunities that allow participants to engage in a way that works for them. For example, rather than simply asking people to engage by unmuting their mics and speaking up, I encourage folks to use the chat or to contribute to a shared document. And I try to acknowledge all of these contributions in the same way and not privilege the spoken contributions, which can be really easy to do because they're a little bit more urgent. Um, I also try and mix up the dynamics in my sessions by providing large group, small group, and individual ways to interact and giving participants choice in how and, how and who they interact with. Um, for example, I'll often do this by offering a quiet room for participants when doing breakout rooms. This validates individual engagement and unsurprisingly reduces the number of people who mysteriously disappear when the word breakout rooms is mentioned. Uh, importantly, I've realized that not all participation needs to be visible to me. I don't need webcams on or participants to speak or do something uh, because often that's for my benefit and not for theirs. So in fact, I'll now often embed reflections um, or other activities that are just for participants themselves in order to really think deeply about a topic. And it took me a, some time to value engagement that I as a facilitator may not even see or get something from, um, and to learn that if people aren't talking, it doesn't mean they aren't learning or participating. So now um, I find it really important to recognize that engagement should hold greater value for the audience than it holds for me. And this takes me to my final tip, which is that good online facilitation means prioritizing the motivations and the needs of the participants. Basically, it's not about me. And it took me a weirdly long time to come to this realization. What this means is that success isn't defined on my terms and isn't about sticking to my plan. I definitely still go into online sessions with a bit of a plan, but I know that the plan needs to be flexible because the people in the room might have a very different idea of what the session should look like and of where they want to end up. And I admit, admit this can be really uncomfortable. 
uh, because it's much more vulnerable to walk into a room or to join an online room without a tightly scripted timed session where I have complete control. But I've learned that that discomfort is actually a good thing because it means that everyone in the room has what they need rather than what having what I arbitrarily decided they needed before any of us showed up. This last one I actually still struggle with a bit because sometimes there are competing uh, participant motivations and goals. There is a relational component to any online learning environment, which means that the climate and the conversation is heavily impacted by who's in the room. Sometimes you may have a room full of people who want to work in silence. So any plan for a rich conversation may fall flat. Sometimes you may have a room full of people who just want to chat. So a design activity may not be a great choice. But more often than not, you'll have a combination of participants with different needs. So now I'm trying to figure out a way to offer both options uh, in a meaningful way where everyone is getting what they need. So I guess I could basically sum up all of my tips as make it about the people in the room, not about the presentation, not about the content. But also to add to that, be kind to yourself because this does require a level of vulnerability and flexibility that might be uncomfortable for some of us.